super excited to introduce to you our next speaker. Ashley Pulse is the VP of Engineering at New Relic, and she will be sharing with you today how, forging your path as a technical leader. So I'm going to go ahead and invite Ashley onto the stage. Hello, right. it's a pleasure to meet you all. Go ahead and share. All right, hopefully you see the screen okay. All right, hopefully you're here today to learn about forging your path as a technical leader. Uh, a little about me, I've been at New Relic for over 10 years now. Uh, during that time, I've had two kids and acquired two dogs, all under 10. Uh, I started at New Relic as a software engineer on one of our teams. <laughs> over the years, I moved into the tech lead role of that team. I then moved into an architect role and then a staff engineer role. I kind of spun around there for a little bit until I became pretty opinionated about how, how architects should be managed and led. Uh, when you have someone very opinionated, a lot of times you give them that problem to solve. So I moved over into management. Uh, I first started managing a group of architects. I then also got a group of staff engineers and now I also own reliability. So my goal today and why I'm here is that I really want to empower all of you to make informed career decisions. We spend a lot of time at work. And so I think we all should be doing something that's both challenging and that we enjoy. And to really do that, you need to own your own career. And the first step to owning your career is understanding your options. So what I wanna to do today is to empower you um, and help you understand some of the key roles that I've had that are pretty standard in the industry for engineers. And I'm gonna go over the responsibilities of each role, the types of problems solved in each role, the skills for success, and then also I'll cover how I transitioned from one role to another. And that's a question I get asked quite a bit is how do I make it to the next level? So we'll cover that as well. All right, so let's start with the software engineer. How many of you are software engineers today? All right, a couple of you. Nice, lots. So I've been a software engineer at three companies and they have pretty consistent standards. Um, really, when you're a software engineer, you're writing reliable, efficient, bug-free code on time. You're fixing bugs, you're improving tests. And when you look at like the spectrum of, I spend my entire day in an IDE writing code to I'm in lots of meetings and presentations, you know, the software engineer is largely over on the right code side. Types of problems that I've worked on as a software engineer is improve the reliability or resiliency of our end-to-end -end test system, add new functionality that our product manager wants, fix bugs such as deployment issues or code that's causing slow startups. You know, all of these things fit in that software engineer domain. So what are the skills that I learned and I think really made at least me successful and many others as a software engineer. You know, the key thing for a software engineer is writing that reliable code and shipping on time. The things that'll make you like stand above the rest is one, understanding the product and the system. So when I was a software engineer at New Relic, I worked on a piece of code called the Java agent. This code runs in other applications, pulls out all of the monitoring information of how long various methods or functions took, sends it to New Relic, and then displays it for our customers in the UI so that they can see where their problems are. Are they missing an index on the database? 
Do they have an N plus one problem? Things like that. And so while I'm writing code in just this small green box here, I found it really valuable to understand what was happening to the data I was collecting and sending to New Relic. What were the transformations happening on that data? How was the data getting stored? How was it getting queried? Where was it showing up in the UI? And then kind of naturally, as I started to understand the product and the system, I also started to make small tweaks here and there in the UI and the pipeline as I saw things that were broken. <clears throat> Also, once I understood the product and the system, it really helped me understand the problems that I was trying to solve. And this is my key second skill here, is you wanna solve the problem, not the task. So one example is, you know, one day I'm pulling my tickets out of JIRA and figuring out what I'm gonna work on. And one of the tickets says, increase the timeout to wait for an app server to come up. So for our testing framework for the Java agent, we spin up these app servers, we run our test, and then we have to spin the app server down. And so this ticket said basically just like, increase the time the test waits before you're ready to use the app server. Well, that's not really solving the problem, right? The problem is that the test is trying to run before the app server's up. And so really I wanna figure out how can I tell that this app server is up and running so that I can execute my test. And so instead of actually doing what the ticket said, the task, which was increase the time, you know, I really thought about what can I do? How can I hook into the state? Can I look at the logs and see when it says the app server's up? Is there a health check that I can get into? And this is really critical because the more you can solve the problem, the better the customer experience is as well. Now for tests, this is internal, but it implies, you know, for the new functionality as well, making sure that you're solving the customer problem and not just the tasks that are handed to you. All right, skill number three here is to take ownership and show initiative. And I can't tell you how many times in my career this has helped me out really at all levels being able to take ownership of something and really drive it to completion. You know, this can be a bug that's just been sitting out there and no one's been able to really track it down. You say, I got this, I'm gonna solve it. And you go and you figure it out and you fix the issue for the customer. Other time it's a piece of new functionality. There might be work that's needed from another team. And instead of just stopping and being like, well, not my team, you know, I went and I get the work done either by having the team do it or I would do it so that I was shipping that customer value and I was taking ownership and showing the initiative and just getting it done. So those are the three that I had for a software engineer. Uh, I eventually moved into the tech lead role. <clears throat> This is the really the kind of the person that guides the execution and the design for the team, right? They partner closely with the engineering manager and the product manager, and they're still writing a bunch of code, fixing tests, improving tests, sorry, fixing bugs, improving tests. But the other at the bottom there, you know, the tech leads helping to design new features and to prior, do some prioritization, help with lever, level of effort estimates. A lot of times product managers want to know, is this going to take a day, a week, a month to do? And so just providing some of those high level estimates. I'm still coding quite a bit, but I'm in more meetings. I'm giving a few more presentations and discussions, et cetera. So some of the things I solved in the projects I worked on here is I led an initiative across multiple of our agent teams to add instrumentation for async processes. So, you know, back in the day, a lot of things were synchronous and you didn't do, you know, more reactive uh, style programming where, you know, work would jump from thread to thread. Um, and then I'm also starting some of the harder bugs, you know, and I'm continuing to develop new test frameworks and not just iterate on the one we have. 
Going into the skills, uh, a big skill here was to understand my audience. You know, I'm not just talking to the engineers on my team now, I'm talking more with the EM, with the product manager, with other tech leads on other teams. And I realized that how I talk to an engineer on my team is very different than how I talk to my product manager, right? On the engineer on my team, I might be discussing, should we use a linked list, an array? Do we need concurrency here? My product manager doesn't care about any of those things, right? They wanna know, are we solving the customer problem? Is it gonna be on time? Do we need to change scope, et cetera? And so I had to change the language and the detail that I was providing as I was talking to different audiences. All right, skill number two here is be seen and network. This means actually sit at the table in the meetings, speak up. And this is honestly something that I've had to continually work on. I'm a very shy, introverted person. Um, and so I've had to learn how to you know, jump into conversations, interject my opinion, et cetera. And I do this some, you know, sometimes it can be hard to jump into a conversation, especially on Zoom. Um, using the hand raise functionality. And I also think, ooh, you know, I haven't said a single thing in this meeting. I should really like make sure my voice is heard as well. Back when we were in the office, one of the great things about New Relic is we used to have a practice where everyone had lunch together in our lunch rooms. And people used to always joke that I would work the lunch room. I'd sit down with a few people, I'd talk with them, get all my questions answered. Then I'd go sit with another group, ask them a bunch of questions, get up and go sit with another group and ask a bunch of questions there as well. And you know, at the time I didn't really think of it as networking, but looking back, what I was really doing was networking. And as a result, I met a lot of people at the company and was able to have a connection and talk with them about very various topics and technology. Another thing I'll mention, we used to have a, a SVP at New Relic who he said he never ever rejected a request to talk to someone who reached out and asked them to talk about their career. And so I encourage you, think about the leaders, the people you respect at your company, reach out, ask if they'll have a conversation with you. The worst that can happen is they say, I don't have time. But more often than not, they're gonna say, sure, I'd be happy to meet with you and talk with you. The other thing to do there is to make sure they know that you're willing to help out, that you want those hard projects so that when they see them, they'll be like, oh, Ashley was talking to me about in being interested in that. You know, she might be a good person for it. All right, third set on the skill set list here for tech lead is make sure you're doing the technical work. You know, sometimes I see people, they move into the tech lead role and they start spending all their time in JIRA, cleaning it up, in meetings, talking about potential things to do. Don't let this happen to you. Yes, you need to help with, you know, backlog ordering, things like that. But you are also the technical lead of the team. Your job is to be that leader to help make those hard technical decisions. So don't get bogged down in just the paperwork. Make sure you're still doing the technical work and asking for those really important and potentially technically hard problems to solve. All right, so for me, I moved into architect next. This is not what everyone does. Some people become staff engineers, other become architects. Some people stay as tech leads forever. It really kind of depends on what you like and what you enjoy. For the architect, an architect's job is really to provide context. So to think about the big picture, what the company needs and what is this team's role and what outside context do they need to make the best decisions. They're accountable for the technical vision. How is this team gonna move forward? What's next? How do we technically keep our coil down? Things like that. They also work on quality. It's important to keep the quality of the services, the team zone at a high level. And then standardization. So things like what languages should we be using across the company? What databases are best for what cases? 
and writing up that standardization and then helping to work to get it into the tooling. And then finally, the architect should be a technical bar raiser. They should be mentoring other engineers and helping up level the technical standard at the company. So things and projects that I worked on as an architect is one, helping uh, push SLO service level objectives and helping teams work through their SLOs. Um, I've done a lot of work in quality standards. So what are some of the standards we should have? How do we define quality? Um, I've also done things like providing feedback. When should we reorg? When is there tension? And helping be an advocate for teams who need more time on reliability or quality, things like that. So what are some of the skills as an architect? Well, I moved from a tech lead to an architect. And one of the first things was now I'm no longer on a team. I don't have this very structured role where you know I go to planning on Monday, I pull my tickets, I demo on Friday, and then I rinse and repeat. It's like, what do I do all day? Uh, and so I had to kind of figure that out. At the time I had, I think seven teams that I was the architect for. And I was like, do I spend an hour with each team every day? And then an hour reading my email or what am I gonna do? And so I realized very quickly that what I needed to do was really focus on the most important projects across the team and make sure those were a success. And also make sure I was weighing in and seeing the technical decisions that were gonna be really hard to change later. So one of the other things I worked on as an architect is our standards for APIs on our agents, right? APIs, things that customers are interacting with, those are the type of decisions that are very hard to change later. And so you need to have a lot of rigor up front to make sure you get it right. Um, the other thing I realized very quickly was that coding, spending all my day coding, was no longer the best use of my time. Instead, I needed to be an influencer and influence the engineers on the teams. And so one of the ways I did this is when I first became an architect, I said, okay, I'm going to go spend a week with each team that I'm an architect for. I'm gonna embed with the team. I'm gonna learn who's on the team and I'm gonna show them that, hey, I'm a helpful resource. I can provide value. And I'm also on your side. I'm not this like person who's gonna just tell you no all the time. And so that you should pull me into technical discussions when you need help and support. The other thing about influencing is when I'm going into a meeting where we need to figure out the technical solution, my job is not to bring my solution and win the conversation, right? My job is to come out of that meeting with the best solution, not my solution. So, uh, but during that time, you know, part of influencing is asking the right questions and really helping to support the teams because really the team should be doing the majority of the coding. All right, and the third skill here is to listen and learn. As I mentioned, I was the architect for seven teams. I was no longer the expert in all those code bases, right? The engineers on the teams were the experts. And so really I had to listen, hear their feedback, and I learned a lot from all the tech leads on the team as well. And together we were able to move forward and ship a lot of great functionality by working together. So this is another key one for architects is that you don't wanna be the one just mandating everything. You have to listen, you have to learn, and you have to work together with the engineers on the teams. All right, so from architect, I moved into a staff engineer role. And, uh, you know, so for architect, my orange dot was way over in meetings and presentations. As a staff engineer, it crept back a little bit over into the writing code side. And I was excited about this. I wanted to more write more code at the time. I was missing writing, writing a lot of code and being a little more hands-on. You know, the things that our staff engineers do at New Relic is really we speed up strategic projects. 
we have a project, we need to ship it. It's really important to the business. So we're gonna leverage a staff engineer to do that. Escalation, sometimes there's a bug and like no one on the team can figure out what is going on, but we really need to fix it. So we'll pull in a staff engineer to do that work. Um, also like some complex problems impacting multiple teams. Uh, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to project management all the teams. And so we'll just have a staff engineer go and do the work. Some, you know, examples of this is like tuning Kafka clients or little things. Uh, we try not to use this for really big projects because uh, you don't want your staff engineers writing a whole bunch of code and then just throwing it over the wall. That never works well. Uh, and then also the other thing about a staff engineer is being a technical bar raiser, right? These people are also setting the technical standard at the company. So some of the projects um, as a staff engineer is like figuring out how to break up a monolithic application into more microservices or services that different groups and teams can work on. You know, we have that strategic project we need to launch, we need to get it out, so we're gonna put a staff engineer on it. Um, also performance tuning, a team that, you know, garbage collection is just taking like all the time. And so they need help doing the performance tuning to get things in a better spot. So going through the skills, number one for a staff engineer uh, is talk before you code. I've seen many, many examples of staff engineers writing a big, complete complex set of code and then dumping it on the team with no description in the PR. And it's like, huh, what is this? Uh, and so one of the things I learned to do uh, pretty quickly as a staff engineer was to talk before I code. You know, an example is I needed to update um, our <coughs> autocomplete library. So at New Relic, we have our own SQL-like language to query our telemetry data. And we have an auto-completer that will suggest what you should type in next. And I needed to do some work in there. So I went, I talked to the team, I explained why what I was doing was important. Uh, then I talked about how we should do it and we agreed on the best path forward. And then I went back and I implemented it. So now when I'm submitting the pull request to the team, they know it's coming, they understand why, I understand their expectations on what I need to do for linters, for testing, things like that, and can do it ahead of time before I even submit the PR. All right, next up, and this really applies ooh, to architects and staff engineers, is put the company before any one team, right? So when you're on a team, I've seen teams like, they're only comfortable changing code in their services. And so instead of like just changing where they're solving the problem, the problem gets solved in their code base and it just gets complicated and complicated and complicated until you have this algorithm. You're like, I have no clue what's going on. And maybe like you could have just made a simple UI tweak where people wouldn't even click that button or things like that. And so, I think it's really important for not only staff engineers, but architects to really put the company first and say, we need to solve the problem in the UI layer or the backend layer, uh, rather than just sticking with like biasing for a certain team. All right, and then my third one for staff engineer, uh, and this also works for architects as well, is to speak carefully. I've been uh, multiple times, I've kind of heard, well, Ashley said, do this. And it's like, I said that, really, are you sure? Uh, and so I always have to be very careful with my language of like, am I saying that you need to go do this or am I just ideating with you and suggesting things that might be really terrible that you should just avoid. Uh, and so being very explicit about what I'm saying, what I'm expecting, uh, and confirming after with like, okay, so this was a brainstorming session. So nothing I said in this, like we don't have to go do any of those ideas. And as a software engineer, I can tell you one thing that architects, staff engineers, leaders appreciate is you actually challenging some of the ideas and saying, I'm not sure if that makes sense. Like, what about this instead? 
Uh, Cause sometimes it can be hard for to, to have people challenge you because of the power dynamics at play. So don't be afraid to challenge or question things being said. Uh, and then when you're in this type of role, make sure you're being cautious about your language so that people don't take something you said and run with it. Um, because I mean, they will. And so you gotta just always be careful. Okay, so I covered four roles today. You know, the software engineer, uh, I think many of you are that today. The tech lead, both of these are in the team. And then the architect and the staff engineer. So these are two examples of what people call today staff plus roles. Um, I think they're probably two of the more common ones across uh, organizations. They're not the only ones out there. They're the two we happen to use at New Relic and that I've been in my past. Uh, there's a couple great books out there as well on Staff Plus that I encourage you to read if you haven't. So with that, I'm going to move into the question I get asked the most, which is like, how do you go from role to role and how do I get to the next layer? And a lot of times, you know, people are very focused on all the boxes on the career ladder. And I generally tell them like, one, you should be talking with your manager, make sure they know what you wanna do. You know, architects is much more of an influence role. There's a lot more communication. Staff engineering, you get to be a little more hands-on and just write code, solve problems. Although you still do have to talk. Um, what do you wanna do? Where are you looking to go? And ask your manager to work with you on what it's gonna take to get to the next level. Also, I tell people focus less on what's on the career ladder, but more about what you're passionate about. Because if you work on things you're passionate about, you're gonna do a good job just because you're excited, you wanna work on it, it's what you're interested in. And then also, I think being on projects and roles that increase your business impact, right? You know, you might have two projects, both you're really passionate about, one is this like tool that maybe is gonna help one team and one is like the most important project for the company. Well, you should choose the one that's the most important project for the company because uh, that's the one where you're gonna get noticed where people are gonna see your work. Uh, and so it'll help you get to the steps and the positions you want. So for me, uh, when I went from engineer to tech lead, it was kind of natural and honestly, just happened. Um, you know, I was asking for the critical projects. I was, you know, taking ownership and really driving them across multiple teams across the company. I'd also been mentoring several other engineers at the company at this point. And I always made sure my projects were a success. And I was really taking that ownership and just, you know, yeah, there's like things that come up that I didn't expect, but we worked through them and we ultimately got the project shipped and work to provide customer value. And so with that, um, I kind of just, you know, the, the, honestly for me, it just happened. Um, and also I continued to tell my manager that I wanted to stay technical. I wanted to work on the critical projects and I wanted to stay technical. So uh, at this point, I had actually a lot of engineering managers come ask if I wanted to join their team. I said no to a whole lot of things. And then this project came up and I really wanted to work on it. And so I asked like, can I work on this? Well, actually my engineering manager didn't think I'd be able to work on that project and also still be a part of the team because it was gonna be so time consuming. And so to make it work, I ended up reporting to our chief architect. And so by really asking to work on this project, I kind of fell into the architect role and I had the brand name by being having driven many successful projects already that I was able to step in and take on that architect role. All right, and then so my transition to architect to staff engineer. I had just come back from maternity leave and I was working on this project. I was exhausted. I honestly wasn't doing that well. I was trying to get this team out of some reliability issues. We just weren't making project progress. 
and I needed a change. And so I just asked, like, I need a change. I need to find something else to work on. Like I am not being successful and I'm out of ideas. And so I worked with my manager and we decided that the best thing for me was to switch to a staff engineer role. And I ended up taking on a staff engineering project where I built another core data type that's um, one of the core data types we support today at New Relic and was incredibly successful in this role. And so here, one of the lessons learned for me is like, yeah, you know, we're not always going to be successful and it's okay to acknowledge that and ask for a change and work with your manager to get that change. So coming back, you know, in transitions and what I tell people when they come ask me about how do I get the next level? Well, one, it's all those skills that we talked about earlier. Two, it's really having co good conversations with your manager about where you wanna go and following your passion and make sure you're working on projects that are important to the business. And so if you do those things, I think, you know, hopefully this information can empower you to make informed career decisions. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, we do spend a lot of time working. And so it is important for us to work on challenging things that are, we also enjoy. You know, I look back at my career thus far and I see a lot of pictures of me smiling. You know, I'm largely happy with my own career and choices thus far. Yes, I've made lots of mistakes, but those mistakes have also translated into opportunities and lessons. And so, you know, I'm kind of thankful I made all those mistakes. And going forward, I know that I'm going to work on things that I'm passionate about. And I'm going to continue to drive my career on things that are important to the business that I'm at and things that I'm passionate about. And I encourage you to do the same. You should be happy and passionate about your career. So hopefully this information today can help you and empower you to forge your own path. And with that, we'll go into questions. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I messaged you a couple questions, a direct message in chat, and I think you might have addressed them, but take a quick look. And then for the rest of us, if you have questions, enter them into the chat and I will serve them up to Ashley. All right, so question one I see here is, was there no competition for the tech lead position? What was it that made them pick you over anyone else on the team? Did you ask to be the tech lead or did they just pick you? If they just picked you, do you think that you would have made tech lead sooner if you'd ask? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, I did not ask at the time. Yeah, potentially I would have been tech lead sooner if I asked. I do think like you should ask for what you want. Um, another thing for me is that, you know, I work at a growth company. And so one of the nice things about being at a growth company is that there's always new opportunities and things to grow. And so having kind of that type environment and keeping your eye out for what are the opportunities that are appearing are super helpful as well. Uh, and then also just, you know, really having those successes and getting that brand name recognition across the company is beneficial. All right, question number two, how do you stay up to date on technical standards while being more removed from writing code day to day? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a hard one. Uh, I talk about this with our architects quite a bit because uh, most of our architects are very busy and they have a lot of projects on their plate at one time. And generally I tell everyone, like you have to make time to still do some coding and engineering work, um, you know, and also reading, you know, the industry news, what is important or sorry, <laughs> reading the industry news, seeing what's happening, what's going on, you know, like I have been, I've done a lot of Java development. I still get my Java newsletter on what they're putting into the next version of Java, things like that. But really, if, if you don't let it happen, like you have to consciously make that time or else it won't happen. All right, question three. I've been working as a software engineer in test and I don't know what my options are. Can you provide some light on that? 
so at New Relic, we don't have a separate test org. Uh, you know, largely we operate in DevOps teams where sometimes engineers on the team have more of a focus in testing. Sometimes they don't, but I, I think the same general principles apply. Like, are you doing testing for the largest and most important projects? Um, have you asked your manager what are some of the career paths at your company that are potential options for you? And do you enjoy the testing or are you looking to get into more DevOps? You know, what's the right uh, path for you? So I think also thinking about what you really like to do and trying to spend more time on that.